Hello everyone, today I'll be going over 10 tips to win at Aeon's End regardless of your level of experience. So whether you haven't won your first game yet, or whether you've won some dozens of games, I'm hoping that this guide will be able to help you win more often. So, our first level of experience we're going to go over is beginner, as in how do I win at all? So these next two tips are going to go over some, th some concepts that will help you win your first games. Uh, so my number one tip is to buy spells, and that's because spells solve the two biggest problems in Aeon's End. The first biggest problem that causes many players to lose the game are these early minions. So letting something like Hayspew or Banesires tick around is just going to absolutely roll you with the sheer amount of pressure and value that they generate. Um, same thing with these tier 2 minions, right? So, to answer those, you're going to want to buy spells. And you're going to want to buy spells early, as early as turns 1 and 2. And the next problem that they solve are going to be these tier 3 cards. So, get, taking 2 or 3 Nemesis turns in a row while you're in tier 3 can just absolutely roll the players. With, like, double unleashes, extra Nemesis turns, and huge minions. So, being able to kill the boss before it plays too many tier 3 cards is a way to prevent these things from ever getting played. So, my number 2 tip is going to be to stop buying cards. Now, what I mean by that is you have to remember that cards aren't useful until you draw them. So, let's take a look at this situation. We're playing against Crooked Mask, we have a fist load of spells, and the boss is at 40 health, over half. So, at this moment, let's look at Kadir. She can get 6 Aether to buy a spell. She could buy another Planner Insight. These Planner Insights, mine, with these two focuses, are going to deal 7 damage apiece. That's a very good value. However, let's try counting up the damage we have loaded up here. So, this is going to deal 2 plus 1, so 3, 4, 5. This will deal 4, so that's 9, plus 7. So, that is going to be 16 damage from Kadir. And then let's add in damage from Yun. So that's going to deal 7 damage here. This is going to deal 4 damage. So that is already up to 27 damage. We're going to add in this 7, this 2. So that's going to be 36 damage. This boss is basically already dead. At this point, buying another Planner Insight isn't going to help you whatsoever. What instead that you should be doing here is just buying charges for your ability, paying off powers, or just getting some life. So here, generally speaking, I would just start buying charges. Maybe even just focus my four breach for fun. Who knows? But buying another planner insight, even though they're strong, completely useless. So my level two are intermediates tips, as in how do I start refining my play? How do I play better? So my third tip is to hold your sparks. And that's because, if you think about it, you would destroy sparks. You would remove them from your deck permanently. And drawing back into sparks really isn't going to help you win the game all that much. So, when you hold on to your spark, when you opt not to cast them from an open breach, you're essentially temporarily destroying them. A second benefit that you get is that you're going to be able to ping down minions with those held sparks when exactly when you need them to instead of just chipping away some health from the nemesis so let's take a look at a mage who uses this concept so Edelheim if you look at his starting deck has five crystals in there and starts with two sparks in hand so what he can do is he can open up his two breach on turn one park these sparks in and then on his second turn cast neither of those sparks just keep them prepped and then he can buy a 5 cost card, say Burning Opal or Darkfire. If he buys his Burning Opal on turn 2, then on turn 3 he will draw it immediately, assuming he didn't cast both of his sparks. If he casts both of his sparks, he's going to draw this hand over again. But if he casts neither of his sparks, he's going to draw Burning Opal, 3 Crystals, and Amethyst Shard, generating 7 Aether, letting him pick up an Arcane Nexus. Or letting him, say, discard a card, pick up a Chaos Arc if he wants to do that instead. Both of which I think are entirely good plays. So, by not casting his sparks, he's able to develop his deck substantially faster. 
and get some of the strongest cards in the game right off the bat. And that applies to several mages with their openings. If you manage to hold your sparks just a little bit longer, you can draw into your strong cards faster. So my fourth tip is going to be to not be scared to spend Aether on Breaches. So opening up Breaches tends to be very important in this game, but you look at a card like Flexing Dagger and you say, oh, that's a lot more efficient than just buying my Breaches directly. And I find that some people kind of take that a bit too far and never buy, spend Aether for the third or fourth Breaches unless you're opening it all at once, say. And I think that at times you're going to want to consider focusing them very directly, opening things the hard way. So let's say you're playing Zaxos and let's say you really want to open your third or fourth breach, right? Even though they're really expensive. So, so one way he can do that is by on turn one buying two flexing daggers. And then on his third turn, he'll have two flexing daggers, three crystals. He just opens up his third breach. And then he destroys his flexing dagger the next time he draws them. So what'd that cost him? Well, that cost him these four crystals, right? Four Aether. Three Aether, the next time we do it, so it's seven Aether. And also four card draws, because he had to draw these flexing daggers twice each. So that is a total of, what, seven Aether and four card draws? That's okay. You get open early. You do extra two damage off of that. But it's not incredible value. All right, well, another option he could do is he could, say, buy a Jade and a Flexing Dagger in turn one, and then he can, say, focus his three Breach twice by cycling the Flexing Dagger twice, and then the third time, when this is going to be five to open, he spends an extra two Aether. So what'd that cost him? So that cost him two Aether to buy the Flexing Dagger. He had to draw back into it three times, and then he spent an extra two Aether. So that's four Aether and three card draws, plus, say, one more card draw because he had to destroy it. So... For a third, four card draws, but it also took a massive amount of time. So instead of opening that up on turn three, it takes him three draws of this. So that's on turn. He draws it the first time on turn three, then five, then seven. So it's a lot later open. It's a lot cheaper. But by not having that open as sooner, he also misses out on a lot of plus one damage instances. He could also say just open it manually. Let's say he focuses his four breach three times. That'll cost him 12 Aether. If you compare it to the other things, uh, the other costs, that is a more expensive, but it is on par with the other options that he may be expecting. So just by opening up this manually, it's sort of comparable to Flexing Dagger. And at the end of the day, you're not always going to have Flexing Dagger in your supply. And even when you do, Maybe you don't want to use it. So my fifth tip is going to be an idea of a canned strategy. As in, when you're starting off and you want to evaluate what kind of strategy you want to go for, you can try using this canned strategy as a jumping off point to evaluating your supply. So the canned strategy is beat down. As in, you're going to get three breaches opened and you're going to try to cycle cheap spells through it as fast as you can. So all of these spells will be excellent in the beatdown strategy. So let's take a look at a supply, and let's try to apply beatdown as an idea to it. So we have Brahma. She has some very good starting breaches, and she wants to get three of them open. So what's she going to do? Well, let's say she just opens them up manually as fast as she can. So turn one, she focuses her four breach. Turn two, she has three crystals in the buried light, so she can open her four breach and then just deal three damage on her third turn right off the bat. And then her third turn will look like this, so she opens up her two breach, and now she has three breaches open, so she can just start picking up ignites. And if she can't afford an ignite, maybe she starts picking up unstable prisms in order to then cycle into her ignites faster. An alternative is that she could just buy an ignite in turn one. And that sort of offsets the breach opening by one turn, but the way it cans out, the way it works out, she can still get them all three opened very easily. So, if you want to use beatdown as a starting off point, you can also think about, okay, well that sounds like a decent strategy. What do the other strategies do for me? Well, what if she say buys a diamond cluster turn one, and then buys a second diamond cluster turn two, and then tries to buy an arcane nexus, right? 
Well, that's a lot slower. And that's going to allow her to get quite a bit more value in the long term. But it's going to leave her and her team more vulnerable to early minions. And maybe that's all right. Maybe you have other teammates who are able to deal with them. But you can kind of try to use that as just your baseline strategy. So my level three tips are advanced, as in how do I win more consistently? So you're winning most of your games, and you want to try to start winning as consistently as possible. So my tip number six is to plan your four-turn opening. So you can count your cards in hand, and you can count every single one of them. I don't recommend that for most players in most situations, but in the case that you are start opening up a game, I think it's a good idea to try and say, what are my first four turns going to look like exactly? So let's take a look at Jian. So you look at her hand and you look at the supply. A very easy thing to say is, I, I have ready to pick my gem, let's pick up the Searing Ruby and let's get started. But is that the best opening? So we think on turn three, what is she going to draw? Searing Ruby, Moonstone Shard, two crystals. What does she do with that? Well, there's no six cost spell to pick up. So maybe what she does is she picks up Darkfire and Jade. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But let's say she wanted to pick up this Consuming Void because it's one of the strongest cards in the game. How does she do that? Well, she could, say, cycle an extra Jade with the Searing Ruby on the third turn, wait till turn five. But by turn five, things get really muddy. So let's try to get that on turn four. Uh, turn three. So on turn one, she could pick up two Jades. And then, we know that on turn 3, she'll draw into two Jades and these three cards here. And that's just enough to pick up the Consuming Void on turn 3. Which is a huge step up from picking up a Dark Fire and a Jade. So, what does she do on her second and fourth turns? Well, on turn 2, maybe she just picks up a Phoenix Flame. Maybe same with turn 4. That way she can just stabilize the early minions. There are plenty of other openings that you can do here. For example, she can pick up two Jades on turn one, and then on turn two, focus her three breach, then open her three breach, and then start trying to pick up some more spells. That's a kind of a beatdown opening. However, it's a beatdown opening that uses quite a bit more gems than the opening might imply. So my seventh tip, is to consider how the nemesis can win. So, all nemeses are going to win in one of two ways, either before tier three or into tier three, right? So let's take a look at Carapace Queen. None of her tier one or two cards are very overwhelmingly strong. Foul Multitudes is probably the most flashy one, but if you played with it, you'd know that like it's manageable, it's nothing special. Also, notably in Tier 2, she has no instant swarms. Every swarm that happens is going to be optional or slow. So that means so that you don't have to worry too much about the husks getting out of control in Tier 2. In Tier 3, however, things can go very far south. And that's because of Maggot Engine. This thing unleashes three times and then puts a huge minion into play that every single turn swarms. Now, you can get over that by just killing it and keeping the husks under control. Or you can try to win before tier 3. And winning before tier 3 is generally the main lane strategy with Carapace Queen. Because of these cards, they're all really good. Now, let's take a look at another nemesis. Knight of Shackles. So, Knight of Shackles is going to try to open up these breaches and then get some various little effects off. Let's take a look at his signature cards. So... His tier 3 cards are really nothing special. Um, this just does some gravehold damage and doesn't let you defocus these breaches. It takes a while for this to lose you the game. This is a power card, focuses breaches, opens them up directly, I mean. And this one opens up his 2 breach, or puts some minions into play. Now, none of these cards are good, but they're all slow. They all take time for it to go off. So you can take a couple of turns in tier 3 without instantly dying, but... As always, sticking around in Tier 3 is not going to be super great for your health. And between these Tier 1 and 2 cards, I think the one that sticks out the most is Route, which just directly opens up his 1 Breach. But other than that, there's nothing to be too worried about here. 
Uh, so I think that the biggest thing is just making sure that you stay on top of your breaches. Just make sure that they don't get open so you don't have to spend the extra money focusing the later ones, defocusing them. So my eighth tip is to remember your timetables. So you know what I said about winning in tier two? Well, in order to do that, you should take a quick, uh, you should take a close look at the time in which you have to do that. So at every different player account, you have some amount of tier one and two cards, but you always have seven tier three cards. And if you break that down, also accounting for the Nemesis signature cards, it looks something like this. You get 14 Nemesis turns in two player, 17 in three player, 21 in four player. Per mage, you get 14 mages in two player and 10.5 in four player, right? And you can also see what that means in terms of how many cards you see total. You're going to see 140 cards in 2 player and 210 cards in 4 player. So, that is like a lot of words. What does it all mean? Well, if you take 14 turns per mage compared to in 2 player compared to 10.5 in 4 player, you get a lot more payoff for building up strong decks in 2 player. However, at 4 player count, you have a pretty limited amount of time. Only 10 and a half turns. You can take some time in tier 3 to bump that up, but at the end of the day, you're going to have less time to capitalize on your deck. However, you get to see more cards in total in 4-player. Because you have more mages. Rather, you have more time before tier 3. I think I forgot to mention, these timetables are right before tier 3 starts. So you have 14 turns before tier 3. 14 nemesis turns before tier 3. So if you're trying to win before tier 3, how much damage do you have to do for every card you see? In 2 player, you have to deal 0.5 damage for every single card that every mage draws. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, the nemesis is still going to be doing stuff. So you can't just throw all of your damage at the nemesis. In 4 player, however, you only have to deal 0.33 damage, only one third of a point of damage per card you draw. So while you have less time per mage to let your deck pay off, you have to do less with those decks. And remember that if you're getting close to your time limit, you're going to start to see tier 3 cards. If you're not meeting your damage per card overall, then you're going to see tier 3 cards. And that's alright. You can see some tier 3 cards a lot of the time. Uh, but it's just something good to keep in mind. So my level 4 tips are for people who want to play optimally, as in making absolutely no mistakes. Or rather, getting close to the state of making no mistakes. So my ninth tip is to card count everything. So card counting how many cards are in your deck, in your discard pile, how many cards are left in every single nemesis tier, what those cards can be, stuff like that. So let's take a look at Malastar. Right? Let's say you have this setup. You have four crystals in your hand, four crystals in your discard pile, a temporal helix, and a radiance prepped. What do you do here? Well, let's say you just cast your radiance, and then temporal helix, the best spell someone else has prepped. Right? That's sort of the obvious way to take it. It does the most immediate impact. That's not awful. You're going to draw radiance next turn, and then turn after you're going to draw a temporal helix, and you can kind of loop that. It's not bad. But let's say instead you just... Temporal Helix and buy two charges. Next turn, you're going to draw the Temporal Helix again, right? So, in fact, with this setup, you can draw Temporal Helix every single turn because of how the deck count has worked out. A pretty strong strategy here would be to just buy charges for the rest of the game and spam your Temporal Helix to just keep casting Radiance every single turn. So, let's take a look at Knight of Shackles. Likewise, we're in a sort of end of tier 2 situation. The one breach is almost opened. We know that these are the two signature cards left in the deck. And these are the last two cards, in fact. So, what do we do here? Are we going to defocus this one breach or not? Well, there's no purpose to defocusing the one breach. Every time we do that, it's just going to be directly opened by route. And Chainsworn isn't going to open it either. So, there's no point to defocusing this one breach at the moment. 
So instead, what you should be doing here is just buying charges. And the only way that you would know that is if you were carefully paying attention to how many cards left the Nemesis deck and what signature cards that they have. So this applies to every Nemesis. Every Nemesis will have a couple of signature cards that will inform and change your play. So my last tip is to play to solve problems and not check boxes. So what that means is that if you want to play optimally, you're not going to want to try and play for, say, I want to have an economy mage, I want to have a damage mage, right? You're going to want to try to solve the problems in front of you. So let's take a look at Claudia. She has only three breaches, none of them start opened, and she has some nine Aether generating cards in her starting deck in hand. A lot of people look at Claudia and say, this is the economy mage. Now let's take a look at Zahala. She has a card that focuses breaches, right? Gives three Aether to focus or open breaches. Her four breach does plus two damage instead of plus one. People look at Zahala and say, this is the damage mage. But let's take a look at the situation. Zahala, with three Aether and her sparkly meteorite, what's she going to do? Well, she can open up her two breach to prepare for her uh, two sparks in her deck. And with three Aether... She can pick up this tether darts, but she isn't going to have quite enough time to open up her three or four breaches. Or she can pick up this exogranite. And the exogranite can let her pick up imbued smashes later on. And also deal with Arachnos's ritual track. So let's take a look at Claudia. With five Aether, there's no real five cause gems to pick up, but she can pick up this imbued smash, which will pair really well with her four breach, which she's going to open on turn two. So, in this situation, the mages are actually more naturally suited to have Claudia as the damage dealer and Sahala as the economy. Or rather, having more economy, right? I don't think that, in general, you should have a mage that only does economy because economy doesn't win you games most of the time. And it's stuff like that. Like kind of, you have to look at, look at the supply and look at the situation and really think about what you're trying to solve. Because if we had Claudia, say, pick up an Exogranite and a charge, what are we doing? Like, is she going to later on buy an Unrefined Blastone and just, like, keep this under control? But that's kind of giving up on this opportunity here, this plus one damage breach. That is just super strong and super early. All right. So... Those are my 10 tips. Uh, I hope that you can manage to find some use out of them. And good luck with your wizarding. Thank you for watching my video.